participatory democracy. This sort of participatory democracy is something that we have always been best out with, and we have always put a lot of effort to uphold the democratic values, be it as a, a smaller group of smaller communities or the larger communities, uh, with a with the, at the same time have a concept of a servant type leadership. So this is something that our culture has already given to the nation, and our uh, effort has always been to balance and harmony the political process with the youthness at the same time the wisdom mm -hmm. of the youth. So this brilliant combination is what uh, makes India a great, uh, how do I put it, an example for the global audience. And you can also clearly see India, like what Professor Sir has rightly pointed out, India is also a significant amount of youth population. And we all know they are the people who really decide who gets to control and rule our parliament and the elections. And we have always been seeing, they have been voting very wisely and also being uh, taking initiative in uh, deciding the national agenda as well through various forums, be it through the community uh, community organizations or even through the private sector championship or also through the academics and other spaces. With the help of Professor, I hope to cover a couple of more points in the sequence of discussion. Over to you, sir. First, uh, you know, uh, you may please present your views on youth in democracy from our cultural civilizational background also so that the viewers would be able to get an overview of what happened and what is the background of our democratic uh, uh, and governance systems in india sir um, sir i think i think the broadly the way to put it would be you now we'll try to capture it in i'll try to capture it into four or five points the first thing sir key the india is has mastered the art of balancing centralism with decentralization as a society as an institution we always have a centralization tendency at the same time as the centralization tendency doesn't weaken the periphery so this is done beautifully in the political system by embracing wisdom and ethics at the same time giving sufficient space for youth to put out their voice out their radical or even sometimes non-conventional ideas this is done through practice of, uh, of practicing inclusivity and building empathy with the young this is one big lesson that i see has made india mature as a democracy now we also see similar type of tendencies in other countries where there is no empathy and inclusivity with the youth now, this makes a huge difference. So the youth feel they are not part of the political process anymore. And this leads to creation of conflict, creation of very violent student movements and all that. India also has a history of student movements, but none of them actually ended up being violent or, you know, lead to a civil war type of a situation. So this is also inspired by another concept that we always have, our religion, our culture, our multipolar uh, system that we have inside us, the multicultural system that we have, always drives individual to transform himself into a, a servant type of a leader. Now, this, this type of transformation, you can see examples of great leaders. Like, for example, we can take uh, from Tamil Nadu, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. He's been a technology entrepreneur, a scientist, a person who stood for the nation's security interests. and considered to be a great role model for every young person today. You can see how he has transformed himself. I mean, in fact, he could pretty well be called as a yogi, a living yogi. He has transcended the art of being a servant leadership perfectly. Now, these are the cultural tendencies sir, that actually push our people to mature democracy in a very, very efficient way. In fact, I'm sure everybody would remember when uh, India started its journey as a young democracy, so-called young democracy in 1947, everybody had their doubts about us. How would they survive? How would they even do elections? It's no wonder we have come this far. Probably we should not underestimate the value of our culture, value of our traditions, value of our love for uh, continuity and self-growth. I think that's what probably is a bigger message to the global audience from India is, have faith, keep moving, respect, be sympathetic to youth, at the same time, respect the wise, wisdom of the elders. I think probably that would sum up, sir, in my humble view. Yes. We all know that uh, uh, when independence was given to India, and even before that, many uh, British leaders, they uh, expected that Indian democracy would not survive. But that was their understanding of India. But if we read the systems, democratic systems of India, we can understand there were times when uh, different parts of our country had no kings at all. Uh, 
But even then, our system survived. I remember uh, a foreigner quoting India. You know, many uh, invaders came from different parts of the world to uh, destroy India, take our wealth. Finally, Britishers came. But in spite of it, India was surviving and then prosper. Uh, India was surviving and uh, moving along. This is because of our grassroots um, living systems that we had. You know, uh, even now, it, during some of our studies, we have found out that uh, apart from the Panchayat Raj elected uh, presidents, there are parallelly native systems that are functioning even today. After the corona, uh, tsunami struck in 2004, we went to uh, the uh, coastal areas of Tamil Nadu. And when we went there, we saw that the particular community, fisherman community that was living there, from Chennai up to Tutukudi, they are called Patinavas. In their own villages, of course, panchayat presidents were there, elected system was there. But apart from that, they had their own um, leaders, social leaders, what they call as notas. So it is they who decided everything because people have chosen them as their leaders. Panchayat leaders, they have their own responsibilities like uh, um, you know, uh, maintaining roads, other activities. But at the society level, they have their own leaders. Uh, similarly, you know, even in our own areas also, across India, we have seen this system. Elders, matured elders, respected elders being considered as leaders and they would be guiding most of their activities. In the northeastern regions, when we went for our studies, particularly Arunachal Pradesh, I remember uh, every 15 days or every month, the entire village engages itself in um, uh, village building activities. Voluntarily, they participate and it is they consider it as their duty. So from every family, Everybody, including the ladies, participate. I myself saw it. So the kind of systems that we have in place, even today, uh, is due to our cultural traditions. So this is aiding the uh, Panchayat Raj systems also. On the one hand, our own people are there. You know, uh, Of course, there are some difficulties, challenges are there for democracy today. But in spite of it, by and large, they are functioning well. But apart from that, we have social uh, leaders at different levels, from the village level to uh, the higher levels. They are guiding the population, people, as a result of which, you know, um, there are not many serious problems. So this is one uh, important uh, factor behind our democratic system. This we have to understand. Sir, adding to that point, I think uh, we can also have a message for the youth from the, like, from, like, for example, sir, it's very difficult for youth to comprehend the enormity of the culture and enormity of the tradition that our ancestors have built over a period of time. Of course, sir, it has its own pluses and minuses. I mean, we can comfortably concentrate on the pluses and see what type of message we can take it forward for the youth. Now, sir, I would like to uh, highlight a couple of pointers, like, for example, through the writings of Swami Aurobindo or Swami Vivekananda or uh, Sri Subhas Chandra Bose, or even V.D. Savarkar. So we have some interesting insights into what, how they conceptualized the construction of, you know, a, a, a path for the youth to deal with democracy, to deal with this. Like, for example, Swami Arbindo, he always insisted on being spiritually elevated when you're assuming power or when you're seeking power. The power, the power journey in the political space should also parallelly follow the power journey in the spiritual space. Now, he insisted that the governance should be guided by higher spiritual, higher spiritual principles and values, without which I believe, he believed that you know, the real progress in our country is not possible, which is probably what he kept on insisting that the youth should continue to evolve into a better human being, better being every day. Probably this is how, in my little view, we could sum up his integral philosophy of yoga. So there is a very nice mixture of spirituality at the same time, with the same time attached to the uh, material values of our world. And of course, sir, any person who's spiritually elevated would almost always believe in collaborative decision making. It is just not possible to be spiritual without voicing out or without listening to others' concerns. If you, on the other hand, if you come to Swami Vivekananda, sir, he wanted youth to take extraordinarily active role 
not just in the national movement, but also in the nation building activity. In fact, we could simply say that he wanted these youth to take the French. You are very right. You are very interest. right. Yes, yes. Uh, that and is the reason why, in fact, Mahatma Gandhi emphasized, you know, democratic systems from the lower level. We all have the spiritually elevated people as our leaders since uh, time immemorial. There are many, many examples that we can quote. They were called Raja Rishis. Even our own uh, Rajas. Uh, they were now unlike the kings from other civilizations, other backgrounds, our rajas, most of them at least, they were all spiritually elevated people. They lived for the society, they contributed for the society. So that is how Indian systems uh, prospered over the years, as a result of which we remind us the Vishwa Guru for several centuries. And uh, even today, I noticed through, throughout our studies, uh, that um, uh, there are leaders at different places who are highly elevated people. Some 20 years back, we were taking up studies in village cooperatives. You know, to my surprise at least, because till then we have not studied much and uh, I, I'm an academic professor. We don't discuss this at all in our classrooms, in our seminar halls, etc. You know, when we went and studied these uh, village level cooperatives, particularly milk cooperatives in Western Tamil Nadu, we came to know that the presidents of the uh, milk cooperatives in many villages, you know, they, they, they completely dedicated themselves for this society. So no salary, no income for them. Um, they had one or two employees. They also came and worked for the uh, society, for the village as a whole without getting salary. As a result, I calculated in those days that the return uh, from the cooperatives, profit was some 10,000 person, 1 lakh person. I remember in a seminar, I spoke that the returns were more than the returns of uh, uh, you know Bill Gates in those days. So this is how we have elevated, as you rightly said, spiritually elevated people or socially concerned people. Because of them, at different levels, even today, our democratic systems, our governance system remain superior. This youngsters should understand. Absolutely, sir. Sir, adding to that, one more thing, sir. Now you have, you have brilliantly highlighted the existence of informal power structures. Yes. Very comfortably with formal power structures. Yes. In yes. a very complementary way. Yes. Now, this, I think, is also another very, very important component. I think our culture and our tradition have always insisted the youth to start looking at taking over you know, self-governance type of initiatives in their local areas. Even though, sir, we do have a panchayatra system, I do believe it is still far away from what originally it would have been in our society. Our society has always been a bottom-up society. And I know it had its own problems at the national level when it comes to defending our civilization, when it comes to defending our national interests. Now, I think the current scope, current design where the center would largely take care of the national security and other issues, I think it is high time that we start looking at reforming the grassroots institutions in a much more natural manner. Like you rightly said, sir, most of the villages already have these institutions and they have been surviving the onslaught of the colonial era and all the other ills that came before and after it. Despite that, they continue to survive. So this, I think youth can have a very important role in building these community institutions, which are a very, very critical component of the governance component that we look at uh, today. And I think the pursuit of self-governance and our local boys working for the local problem solving is a very, very gratifying thing, both for the elders and also for the people. Even now, sir, I can see most of my friends and colleagues who live in cities, they have that deep drive towards their own villages, their own towns, and they always want to go back and do something in return. There is also a very, very, this very important drive. And this is a drive that we should capture by creating a small, small innovations, a small, small charitable organizations community organizations. And somehow, sir, I see youth generally shying away from actively participating in politics. Correct. So most of that, that I think we, they have to overcome that. So there is, a, there is another false notion that is spread around saying politics is all very bad and there's a lot of uh, difficulties that you'll have to go through. Yes, sir, politics is a 24-7 business. It's not like a job where you get up in the morning and go in the evening. It's a, an unrelenting, non-stop, continuous activity. So it's not for everyone, but there are, I'm sure there are many, many leaders who are just hiding, just waiting to cross that one small threshold. I think maybe this whole initiative of uh, Y20 would give them hope. And I think there are a lot of great examples of our own boys who went abroad 
and did fantastic work. You take any top CEOs of the big corporations, sir. Now each corporation is as good as a, a big, a big, at least a district. If not, if not a country, no, it, at, at least as that. But they are able to very clearly demonstrate their leadership skills, surviving on the, against all odds. Now those boys can comfortably manage a district, a state comfortably. So that inhibition probably is what I think we need to push. And probably that requires some amount of confidence. And I think government has been doing fantastic work in trying to give confidence to the students. Sir, any student or any young person who doesn't earn a salary, take care of himself. I really don't think he'll be confident enough to stand up for others. So that empowerment is also needed. I think government has done some decent work in this last at least five to 10 years timeline. We have hundreds of startups which are doing very good. More than a crore or two crore youth are getting trained in various skill sets. They're able to find jobs despite the extremely harsh environments abroad. And I'm sure, I think there, there was also an article where I read recently around 42 crore people have been lifted out of the extreme poverty in India. Now, all this is possible because of that drive that they have to give back to their society, give back to their people. I think we should channelize that a little bit more, sir. And another thing that I always wanted to ask, sir, is about the concept of uh, cultural nationalism. So I think the youth, the young people want to do something for their society, but they, are, they don't have a framework to understand how do they contribute back to the society. Probably Y20 type events may help, sir. And uh, any, any thoughts on that area, sir? You are right. You are right. There are two, three points I want to make. One is that, you know, leadership, you know, political democracy, political governance is one aspect. The other aspect is non-political democratic and governance systems. So if we see the uh, business and economic sectors of India, you know, we have uh, several th thousands of uh, entrepreneurial leaders in different parts of the country. You take any place, whether it is Surat or Coimbatore or Belgaum, you take any place. All these places have grown in the last 50, 60 years, by and large, because we know the Britishers had systematically destroyed all of our economic centers. So in the last 60, 70 years, maybe just before independence, some 20, 30 years back, after the Swadeshi movement started in 1905, you know, initiatives came up. But in the last 60, 70 years, if we see India's history, the economy has been continuously growing, uh, even though there were confusions and contradictions at the policy making level for about 65 years initially. So for about 30, 35 years, our uh, uh, political setup, our ruling establishment favored the socialistic approach. After that, for about 20 years or so, uh, this uh, globalization approach. But in spite of it, India has been growing. When we analyze the reasons behind it, we see the leadership at different levels, leadership at the business center level, leadership at the society level. So as a result of which, if you see different uh, parts of the country, you know, if you take Surat, 2 lakh turnover every year, completely built by the entrepreneurial leaders of that region. Similarly, you take Coimbatore, maybe it's about 1.25 lakh crores or so annual turnover. So this is how India has been growing. The reason for this is leadership, social leadership, entrepreneurial leadership. You know, they have a vision and they are building upon it. You know, unlike uh, the present days where we have a strong leader at the center, Earlier days, there were uh, problems for them, confusions for them. But in spite of it, you know, they identified one area and then entered that area, worked hard. And today, they have made that area as a very important, uh, vital area, not just for the country, in many places, for the nation as a whole. Tirupur was an unknown place till 1980s. But today, it exports 40% of India's knitted garments. Why? Because there were leaders. Many of them were less educated people, financially coming from ordinary backgrounds. But this particular trait of taking up leadership in entrepreneurship, this is what has built India and made India today. So this is one aspect this youth have to understand. So the, as you rightly said, the youngsters have to study the history of India and the present functioning systems of India to understand as to how the governance systems, leadership systems are working at the 
local level different uh, just level. to add to just to add to yes. what you just said sir now yes. if you look at it sir in the last at least 10 years timeline or maybe 5 to 10 year timeline if we talk of entrepreneurial summits the senior entrepreneurs and all that now we suddenly start seeing a lot of young faces it could yes. be ATM, it could be Zomato, it could be Swiggy, it could be anything. We suddenly see a flurry of young leaders coming forward and entering areas which generally we would generally shy away from as a society. So we have a series of unicorns, we have a series of companies which are like very rapidly built and youth are willing to take chances, sir, willing to take risks now. And it is very happy to see because they are, they have confidence that they will get things right. They are suited for this era now. You know that, that confidence is based on journey of centuries of our previous entrepreneurs who have built careful relationships, nurtured social capital, built some sort of risk-taking appetite. You can clearly see, sir, our people had a lot of experience, especially from Tamil Nadu, Andhra, and this coastal belt. They are fantastic business relationship with the Southeast, Oman, Muscat, all those places. Now, our young generation is suited, had confidence to take their businesses abroad. I can see a lot of Indian businesses, Indian entrepreneurs, doing fantastic business, not just in the Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia, Americas, and Europe. Not just as a salaried technocrat, leaders, as CEOs, and others, but they are also running their own businesses. Now, this is a very, very good trend, sir. I think they are, they are, they are already benefiting from the experience and wisdom that we have built as a family or a society or a community here. I think that, that change is already happening, sir. Yes. You know, in the recent period, as you have mentioned two times, that the confidence of the youngsters have increased. Confidence of the Indians have increased overall. I think one of the biggest achievements of the present Modi government is that, of, of course, they have uh, delivered on uh, several fronts. You know, they have achieved so many things in different fronts. But the most important of all, in my opinion, is giving confidence to Indians. You know, we can do. Because for a long time, as we all know, we were under... Uh, foreign rule and all, and even after independence, our confidence level were much low. You know, that is the reason why during the socialistic uh, uh, period, governance period, initially 30 plus years, you know, even though our people wanted to do much entrepreneurs, they could not do. But now in the last 10 years, 9, 10 years, as you rightly said, the confidence have increased as a result of which we see youngsters entering into different areas. And uh, uh, we come to know that there are 108, 108 unicorns today. And we are the third largest uh, um, country in terms of these unicorn startups. So now different areas, whether it is digitalization or it, whether it is in the social field, now youngsters' participation is increasing. And this is a very welcome step that is happening. Uh, in India today. And apart from that, as you mentioned, now educated people are entering uh, the grassroots political field also, even though there are inhibitions from educated people, because when they see the political setup in different uh, parts of the country, at the state level particularly, uh, you know, they may not get that much interest. But after seeing the national level, and after getting confidence, now we can see highly educated people entering into political battles at the panchayat level. I know I have seen in Rajasthan, I have studied now, you know, in places like Rajasthan, many other several places, you see foreign educated people coming here and contesting elections. You know, this is a welcome step and educated people have to enter and clean up the system uh, and help the country democratic uh, process to uh, prosper and then function in a very vibrant manner. That is what is required today. Of course, there are several challenges uh, in the democratic uh, system today. Yes, sir. As a result of which we are facing very serious problems. But once the educated people, people with commitment enter, then that will be good. Sir, I think, uh, I think probably this is the next logical step for most of the young entrepreneurs who started their journey because they're assuming business risk is itself very complicated. I think political risk is a quite a totally different ball game altogether, but I presume that they would try to take it as a next logical step. And I also see two other components, sir, which are uh, creating a new generation of youth who are willing to take a risk in a risk and try to venture into politics. One thing I see is, sir, the sudden digital transformation of our country. A lot of things have become very, 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 very automatic and simple. 
So this digital transformation has created an environment where people started perceiving the barriers coming down. Like you want to deal with the government, barriers have come down. You want to start a business, barriers have come down. You want to voice out your opinion, just go to Twitter and start tweeting. Just go to Facebook and start posting. So the, the barriers are generally started coming down. So this, this creates a favorable environment for the youth to perceive that the risk level has come down. Second, another very, very important thing, sir, which I also see is most of the Indian youth have in one way or another exposure of the foreign developments. Either they work there or they work for a company which works there or see the trends. So they are also clearly started comparing, okay, how does it happen there? How does it happen here? What is it that we can do here? Now using technology, using innovative means to reach out to people, using small, small format videos, so these are all innovations that came up out of, I think, a, a simple sort of a comparison between this, that state, this state, this state, that state, or maybe outside India, inside India. So this whole thing has suddenly started creating a positive vibe. And adding to this, sir, the international recognition that India is getting, be it because of its uh, fantastic positive role played during the COVID pandemic, our subsequent, our clever diplomacy where we benefited in the end without, you know, without, without aggravating the crisis, at the same time playing the peacemaker role in the Ukraine issue, and at the same time benefiting from Russia, and at the same time benefiting from America. Now, this, this, type of, this type of confidence also gives the confidence generally to the youth that, yeah, this is something that we should try. This is something that we would like to enter into. I think, sir, now, probably like you rightly started, sir, there are many non-political ways of entering governance too. Because like, like you said, go governance is a very comprehensive topic it covers the political and the non-political in non-political also sir we see something like maybe through non-community organizations or private sector or ngos or academia even there the youth can play a very important role sir yes. like wh what do you think about the public policy states sir, in india yes yes you know in our own studies in the last 30 years we have seen that uh, this non-political leadership non-political governance system uh, have played and even today are playing a very, very important role, vital role, I would say. You know, wherever we go, we see people, uh, um, um, we can call them leaders, even though they are not leaders in the political term. It is they who, who um, you know, um, uh, who run the, the, the particular localities in specific places, whether it is uh, village management or uh, town management with regard to particular areas. As you rightly said, of course, these panchayat systems are there. But along with that, these systems are playing a very important role. Now we see NGOs, uh, nationalistic NGOs. For example, I've seen in Coimbatore, there is a, an NGO called Siru Tuli, small drop. You know, they are uh, uh, taking up this uh, water management work and they have done very wonderful work in the last seven, eight years. I have seen this in different parts of the country. We know that throughout the country today, there are individuals, we can call them as, uh, you know, social leaders. There are individuals, there are small group of organizations who have committed themselves for the welfare of the society. And in this respect, particularly in the last uh, few years, Technology is playing a very, very important role. And you know, Indians are the ones who have adapted to technology more than any other country. We know now 46% of the digitalization works that are taking place, transactions taking place across the world is are taking place in India. So technology is playing a very, very important role. So we're, uh, even from the government point of view, uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi wants to speak to the people in Mahanki Bar. Every month he gets ideas from people. So it reaches him as a result of which he takes up issues that are known to even the people at the local level. Very, very important issues to give our uh, people confidence, to, give, to tell us what is happening uh, in different parts of the country. Similarly, uh, if you see the selection of people for Batma Awards, you know, through technology, this is a highly democratic process. So if you find somebody who has committed his or her life for the society as a whole, without expecting anything, you can write to the government of India where they will get recognition. So technology is changing our uh, democratic process in a much faster way uh, in the recent periods. 
and youth has played a fantastic role sir like you like you rightly said most of the initiatives that the honorable prime minister takes or any other minister takes they are all driven through the youth only like yes. like for example sir now yeah. there is a joke uh, that goes around the twitterocracy the democracy is called the twitterocracy now oh most of the complaints are put on twitter and they are quickly attended oh. i see the government machinery rapidly and uh, rapidly responding to the tw- tw- tweets and posts recently okay. sure i've seen similar events in uh, this now uh, coming back to another another component sir now the youth has played a very very important role in a lot of grassroots movements like you talked about the movement in the agriculture now we are also seeing some sort of a community type organization movements like bringing the people who are uh, affected by floods people who are affected by environmental issues now those activism sir this this they, they need to be put into a framework so that their individual initiatives yes. are all brought together under national umbrella or some sort of a thing maybe there is some scope for yes uh, yes, yes. Uh, some sort of organization in that space sir any thoughts on that sir yeah yes so yes that? so th- there is also a scope there is also a scope for encouraging uh, those type of smaller community organizations under a bigger umbrella maybe they are the yes. role of like sp mukherjee foundation research research foundation and others they can come together to give them some sort of a broader policy guideline or something so that the individual efforts of the users which are largely at a micro level also lead to a macro impact so i think there is a general yes, yes. gap in public policy space uh, in this space sir there is uh, not amount of, not a, not good amount of effort put on identifying correct type of problems which have to be solved and i am i am also sure in india most of the problems are very common like for example trying to trying to support the farmers is a very common problem across india and many state governments have are been doing many many different different type of schemes to help them now even now we don't have a consolidated repository of what worked and what did not work so there is i think youth also has a lot of uh, space in this thing if you really don't want to participate in active politics you can definitely take an active role in filling this data gap and uh, of course youth also has other alternatives like joining civil services and getting into uh, ias ips iras and other things and try to contribute their role back into the society i'm saying generally youth has so many options now and some of the options which i think they need to spend more time on are public policy collecting data coming up with alternatives and also identifying and researching on what worked and what did not work even crop insurance as an idea sir so it's an idea that has not received enough attention in india now i am also believing that generally now uh, the whole uh, upi has revolutionized the way the payments and the distribution of money direct benefit transfer all of them now i also perceive that there is another revolution going to come which is probably in the healthcare system maybe through national health care authority or national digital health mission now that also would require some sort of inputs from the youth in taking it to the final milestone and also coming up with some policy suggestions and ideas i think uh, these are also a couple of things that i think we should also pay attention to sir no you are right in fact y20 is a forum where youngsters like you can put forth the suggestions to the g20 uh, group Uh, through which you know yeah, they can uh, um, develop uh, plans schemes etc so it's a forum for you to give ideas uh, when you mentioned the calamities i remember you know when we study the global situation today in india wherever there is a calamity serious calamity then the entire society participates i myself observed and participated as i mentioned in the tsunami experience 2004 5 and the recent chennai floods or wherever it is orissa rail mesha though there are organizations like rss sangha different organizations that voluntarily participate immediately but there are several other organizations also at the individual level also youngsters they form a group whatsapp group and then help we remember in there was in chennai floods there were several youngsters group of youngsters who created this was whatsapp groups through which you know they helped the entire society so that corona sure again we have seen as to how food was delivered to people in different places through these groups so whenever there is a calamity you know indians immediately rise up to the occasion and then help the other people but as you uh, said there may be requirements for some policy changes of course you can give uh, 
uh, these suggestions which can be taken care by the G20 group as a whole. And uh, another important point that I wanted to mention here was uh, relating to governance. You know, as far as the governance aspect is concerned, in my opinion, we have enormous uh, wisdom. Indians have enormous wisdom or Indian societies have enormous wisdoms in terms of governance. If you see the uh, history or even the contemporary functioning systems, you know, no other country has such a system in spite of some limitations also. You know, we have seen uh, how in India uh, different sectors were managed, not just political leadership, social leadership, you know, down to the family level, the governance systems were very superior. Of course, there may be some problems at all. As you rightly said, there are, we have to look at the positives and build upon it. Even today, you know, uh, now in spite of the several challenges that are facing India, you know, it's the superior governing systems, whether at the social level, family level, or at the business level, that are helping India to emerge as a powerful nation. I, as a research scholar engaged in uh, these field studies, I feel that youngsters should be taught about it. They have to be aware of it. Otherwise, you know, in our education system, at least till these days, we know nothing about them, but we have very many positive aspects with regard to governance. Our governance system are very, very superior. I remember after the global economic crisis in 2008-9, there were severe problems in the West, particularly in America, uh, uh, relating to this uh, company management systems, corporate management systems. So they were facing severe leadership crisis. You may be knowing that, you know, group of academics, social activists, they went and sat before all big corporates, including universities. They said, you know, we don't want this kind of leadership. So at that time, um, a, a group of professors from Kellogg University, America, they came and studied the Indian leadership pattern. They identified top 101 companies, both private sector and public sector, and met with each of them, 98 chief executives of different companies. And finally, they wrote an article. It came in the form of a book also. So in the Harvard Business Review, I remember um, in 2010, they wrote uh, their experiences. The title given to their article was Leadership Lessons from India. They said the leadership pattern in India is very superior compared to that of US and many most of the all other uh, European countries, Western world. They said the reason for the leadership uh, unique leadership systems in India is due to the uniqueness of the society and the uniqueness of the cultural system. So all boils down to this. So we have enormous cultural social foundations today based on which we have to build our governance systems. You know, in many places, even today, we see uh, the systems are superior, but we have to make youngsters understand that it is because of these foundations, stronger foundations, we are doing well. Certainly, we can build upon it. So just to carry forward the idea that you have done and that you have elaborated, sir, I remember one, one very simple example because I'm sure most of the young people who are watching probably will also connect with like the way I connected with it. Let's look at the example of Ashwamedha Yag. There is the Ashwamedha Yagna that is conducted by a supreme, a bigger king. And instead of moving his army and coming to a face-off, he simply pushes a horse. Now, if you don't want to fight, at the same time, don't want to feel humiliated in front of your own people, you quietly let that pass through. Sir, is this not a brilliant way of conflict resolution? Yes. Now, this is, I'm sure there are many more examples like this, I'm sure, which is why I think Panchatantra is a great book on governance. And recently, I've started reading about a book called uh, Kamandakas Nidhisara. Another fantastic book full of brilliant insights on governance. I hope, sir, uh, these books also get some sort of attention. Yes. Unlike the way people, people give to Sun Tzu's Art of War and others. I think <laughs> they have much more relevant lessons for us than the others. Uh, and coming yes. back, sir, 
consciously coming together. I'm sure all of us have our experiences in COVID time. All of us have either been part of two WhatsApp groups or three WhatsApp groups, distributing food, distributing oxygen cylinders, or picking up people and dropping up people. And I can see that same thing happening at a national level too. Sir, we all know Turkey was not supporting us as a country in the Kashmir issue or any other issues. The moment they were under trouble, India was the first country to respond under the Operation Dosti. Yes. So, so the, this sort of thing, looking beyond the petty narrow disagreements in the larger global interest is something that India has always been. Yes. And India will yes. continue to be, I hope, sir. Yes. So yes. I think our, our way of pursuing uh, our own foreign policy, I think is called as enlightened self-interest. Yes. I will pursue what is good for my people, but also for everyone else. Yes, 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 yes. This difference is what India always leads up. Yes, 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 yes. Particularly the foreign policy under uh, Prime Minister Modi's role. Uh, uh, you mentioned about this uh, uh, helping other countries. Oh, it has earned a lot of goodwill for us because this is how our tradition function. You know, we all consider the whole world as a family. So this is our strength. So in my opinion, after studying, um, uh, making field studies in different parts of the country and as a teacher, I have great confidence that the youth of our country uh, will be able to contribute to the democratic and governance process much better in the coming days because the um, in the present system, uh, in the last few years, things are improving much better and there is huge scope for the youngsters to enter into different fields, fields of their choice and contribute to the nation building process. So I feel this, this is a great time for the youth and when youth fully contributes, uh, then the entire democratic country, India, will rise up and become a very important global power in a... Um, you know, very less, lesser period, maybe five, to five years, 10 years, much lesser period. You know, that's what my feeling says. 100%, sir. 100%, sir. I'm sure being a young country has its own advantages. Yes. And I see a lot of effort uh, that is being put in ensuring that the demographic dividend is also properly elected. Properly yes, elected. yes, yes, yes. The demogra demographic advantage. Yes, yes, yes. Because that so I, could be yes. a big risk too. <laughs> Can we ask our... Uh, Yes, uh, viewers, uh, to uh, put forth a few questions to you before, uh, because we have 10 minutes more. Jagan? Yes, Jagan? Why she is not yes, on? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, if uh, you have any queries, you can ask our friends have any queries, let them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A very nice session. Uh, friends who are par uh, participants who want to ask questions, you may unmute yourself and ask the questions to our esteemed panelists. Jaganji Balaji. Yes, yes, Balaji ji, please. Ji, uh, for the discussion of the uh, uh, important issue uh, that we to highlight. 60% of the population less than 35 years still are in there. So in the last 10 years, different uh, ideas are coming from startups. Mm -hmm. Very innovative, very out of the box thinking. Like uh, Paytm, Policy Bazaar, OYO, uh, uh, Swiggy, etc. Where are you from? 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 Where are you Different at Granger, youths on the Nigas on a Marina Laida Pandanga, the Yinga Yepudi at Granger. And the ideas on the spark of the Yinga. Sir, now uh, I think, sir, I will answer in English. If someone can help me convert it in Tamil, that will be better. Sir, one big thing that I think we all have to understand is exposure to how others live, how other places are. You take any example Flipkart, Amazon, yes. Oyo. Similar copies outside. See, ideas are what ideas are initially coming to our young people by observing what is going well, take it nicely, customize it for Indian needs, and build it here. Oh, yeah. This is what our boys are doing. As a culture, as a society, we have made a very, very big mistake in the last 400, 500 years. We have cut off ourselves from the world. This is our biggest mistake. 
very humbly put sir i'll give you a simple example sir two very important technologies which has led to colonization of india gunpowder compass oh. both came from the chinese and they are our neighbors we did not learn from them someone from europe has learned from them and mastered those two technologies to colonize us i think sir as a society we should continue to be looking outside for ideas and build for india by customizing them this is where most of these young ideas are coming and second thing sir like you rightly said the young population of india their behavior patterns are very very different from the old even 40s and 50s people who are 40s and 50s they are called digital natives the way they use the products will by design make the existing products outdated so any person who is very keenly watching the way they use products knows what to build next like we all know google is a thing of our generation probably a server like chat gpt types is more suited for the next generation but think about this also chat gpt makes you progressively dumb because you will not think for yourself chat gpt will think for you so that's also a risk this is where as a society we have to balance the wisdom of the aged at the same time with technology i hope i have answered your question sir yes thank you thank you nandri very rightly put on uh, i remember a quote where i read about technology today's aggressive players becomes tomorrow's defensive incumbents so that's true i think we have questions from arvind uh, sanjeev dua you may arvind you may please go ahead then sanjeev dua ji can ask uh, sir uh, namaskaram and it was uh, a very wonderful session as always uh, i would like to no more about that kamantaka's neeti sara which you mentioned uh, if you could uh, throw some more light upon it it will be better. it will be of immense use to everybody yes because okay uh, as as I, as i always believe spiritually if you are deeply rooted in civilization that will really help in unraveling our hidden potential so kindly 100% 100% very 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 valid question see kamantaka's neeti sara is a as a very rare book on how to govern your country it's uh, of course like like the traditional like the traditional way we do we don't uh, take claim of ownership of any book if you see historically in any in any of these books starting with ardha shastra none of the authors claim that it is theirs the only say i am following the footsteps of my guru and i am trying to humbly collect whatever i have learned from my teacher and write it in my own way so mm-hmm. kamandaka niti sara also starts like that mm-hmm. kamandaka niti sara is a brilliant book on polity now if mm-hmm. you take the comparison with ardha shastra which the which is a more famous kautilyan one ardha shastra is about governing a kingdom it's a mm-hmm. book on full fledged book on political institutions polity philosophy everything covered very exhaustive book kamandaka niti sara on the other hand is a very small relatively simpler book but clearly divides the type of work the king is supposed to do and the type of the work that king is supposed to supervise it is also acts as a advisor or a guide to the king i would say with the same level of quality same level of clarity panchatantra also teaches you governance mm. today when i teach stories from panchatantra or quote from kamandaka to my own son mm. i learn more from that experience than him i am not sure how much he has learned but i definitely know i have learned more Okay. Hmm. So it is basically Niti Sara. I'm sure you understand Niti. Niti hmm. means a political advice. Hmm. It's a political advice on how to conduct your political matters. Political matters means anything that deals with power. Hmm. In fact, there are also other great examples like Sukra Niti, Vidura Niti. But you can very clearly see they are all same truth repackaged and sold multiple ways. Hmm. But I found. kamandaka's neeti sara to be a very exhaustive coverage at the same time concise enough for a person to read in probably 5 to 10 years thanks a lot thank you please pleasure dua ji you may please go ahead with your question yeah namaste everyone thank you very much uh, very nice session 
uh, I had one observation and I am going to seek on some uh, guidance on this and views on this. Uh, so essentially I work in uh, IT consultancy domain where we hire people. Uh, lately what I've seen is that uh, you have a lot of positions which are available in IT domain, uh, but the value system of the candidates really gone down. For example, they will promise that they will show up, they don't show up, uh, they will say they will join, they back out to the last minute. Uh, they are not capable for a job, still get higher paid salaries. Uh, you know, where are the morals and ethics going? I wonder why light is happening to India and, you know, whatever is happening is great. Uh, but uh, working very closely with the today's generation, uh, which is in IT domain, I feel very disappointed. Uh, you know, I feel uh, terrible that they have no value systems. So uh, what can we do to, to, you know, build this value system, which is going down the drain? in today's uh, IT workforce, which is like 20 to 27, 28. Uh, yeah. Just some, you know, thoughts. I I, like I'm, I work so closely, I'm so disappointed, I can't tell you. <laughs> Sir, I, I understand where you come from, but I think we also have to contemplate and uh, truly accept what type of services, work culture that we have created in our country in the last 20 years, which is what, sir, in fact, I, I run a product company, so I experience the same type of pain that you experience. But I would probably say our young kids have been dealt a very bad hand. The type of culture that they are pulled into the company like and the company doesn't give him loyalty they are hired for a project project is over they are they're fired now if you don't expect loyalty from an employee the employee treats everything as a transaction he's there to see what i get out of it now this creates an absolute short-term mindset now this is uh, this is a lose-lose situation sir i'll give first example the company loses a great guy who has worked for three, four years and built experience just because you don't have a project. Second thing, these kids who have who been just been fired from this company goes and joins another company with this three years experience. Now that company will only use him for that technology. Because it's a very valuable resource. They can't invest anything on him. So after five years, when the technology is disrupted or replaced with a new technology, this fellow is suddenly unemployable. So to hedge himself against that risk, he tries to rake in as much money as possible because he knows after five years, someone is going to fire me and I'm not employable. So it's a very toxic system that we have created totally as a unfortunate consequence of our, how do you put it, a weak participation in a global economy. We are nobody in global economy, sir. We have to pick the breadcrumbs what are thrown at us. So we were beggars, not choosers. So we've been, we've been used like this. It's okay. We created some amount of capital and wealth because of that experience. But I think it is also high time that we also try to create product companies which respect loyalty and tell the employees that I treat you as my family. I expect the same from you. Then I think you would be able to have a good success rate, sir. In my humble opinion, sir, I can tell you confidently at, at least place where I have, I have around 200 people with me. Five or six people have left us largely for personal reasons. It, it is doable, it is eminently doable, provided we communicate to them clearly that I am not going to take you and fire you when I don't have a work for you. I will take care of you. So that uncertainty probably, you know, will scare them off and try to make it look like a short-term transaction for him. My, my humble thing, sir. I think it will change, sir. It, it's a matter of time, that's all. I think uh, you've uh, made a very good point. I appreciate your point of view. It's very uh, nicely put, actually. Just one last concern there is that, uh, you know, uh, for an example, people uh, don't want to go for a physical interview. They want to just sit and, you know, do a virtual interview. Come on, you know, why can't you make an effort to get a job? So uh, that, so, then he's not serious. I, 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 yeah, you know, frankly, I, I remember going for 10 interviews and getting one job, right? I just don't understand this culture, uh, what this problem today. Sir, which means he's basically trying to have an option. It is not really a necessity, which is why, sir, I take only physical showings, physical walk-ins. If you really want it, please come. Then don't waste my time because my time is also valuable. When interviewing my my team, my team's time, our team is also valuable. So I'm not going to be a second option or third option for you. If you really want, please come show up. When you show up, I have respect for you. You have respect for me. No, that's, so that's a good, a point. good base to that. start. That's excellent <laughs> point. Well put. Yeah, well put. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, wanna come? Sir, wanna come? Wanna come, sir? Uh, uh. Uh, Dr. T. Sivanyana Siddhi, sir. Uh, sir, I ask one question. Most of the media and the communication system misguide the youth by the influence of 
ruling parties how can rectify this problem <laughs> sir if you if you have uh, let's say dirt water coming into your house how do you wash it by pouring normal water push it out yes sir <laughs> now internet you don't need 30 crores to start a tv sir to voice out all good people have to sir we start talking people will listen isn't it sir yes sir it's a that is a democratization of the technology so you don't need 30 crores to start a tv channel you can look at how many youtube influencers we have yes sir yes sir we have to stay on the top of it sir Technology okay. doesn't care who it is, who is using it. The one who uses it wisely will go up. Absolutely. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Fantastic, Anna. Next, uh, we have a question by Dr. G. Ranganathan. Uh, he is a very active participant in all our programs. He, uh, he has uh, typed, Anna, would you request, I mean, I can I request you to ask, it, ask yourself or uh, want me to read it? Yes, sir. I'm here. Uh, this is Ranganathan. From Coimbatore. Uh, sorry, I fully agree with uh, professors and uh, the speaker's view that uh, digital transformations and then confidence building, very particularly the con confidence building that has been done by the present government internationally, is uh, making youngsters take up much more risks. This is fully 100% it is uh, very correct. But one point is that uh, the um, unwinding of the uh, the uh, what I can say, non-productive things that have happened in the last uh, two, three decades may also require to be attended uh, actively or positively. What I mean is that, uh, for example, a two-wheeler uh, uh, owner driving on the road, we don't require the two-wheeler, really speaking, if the public uh, transport is there. The youngster is not able to understand that he feels that driving a two-wheeler is uh, a more respect for him. That too, with the silence removed and uh, uh, with a big noise we drive, he feels co very confident. I think that is the wrong thing that has happened. Or uh, something like owning a two-wheeler itself has become the result of the materialistic feeling that has been brought about in the last uh, two, three decades. That if you are earning, you should own a vehicle. Whereas if you go to Japan or to uh, Germany or many places in US also, the public transport is uh, uh, good. I am not talking about uh, transport actually. Uh, thinking at the views what the youngsters have gained, they require to be unwound. And uh, second point in the same uh, spirit is that as uh, Sanjay Dua has uh, made it, the family values or the respect for the uh, like you now one's own life and his own family and for his own country. That is also, I think, it is yet to come back and sit on the rails. It is still uh, going haywire based on the uh, previous happenings. So I would like the panelists to give you how this is going to move forward, what correction factors are going to be applied on that. Thank you. Sir, uh, Professor, sir, should I speak for two minutes? Uh, yeah, please. Sir, I think the fundamental challenge that has happened in the last 25, 30 years is that the parents are spending way, way less time with their kids than anybody else. Sir, no teacher can provide values to you. No school system can provide values to your kids. Fact. Second point, sir, most importantly, because your parents are not spending time, parents don't have a larger than life ambition or a goal in their life. They're just trying to survive. That's what kids observe. So they lack attention. They lack goal setting. I'll give a simple example, sir. Every one of us know Daud Ibrahim. He's the number one, number one terrorist that India is looking for. His father was a Mumbai police constable. Imagine if someone would have met him when he was young and told him, Are you become an SP, you become an IPS, your father will love you. What sort of an asset he would have become to us? We have to accept that we are spending far, far, far less time with our kids than our parents have spent with us. And that, that gap, nobody can fill. Which is, why, which is why our ancestors always insisted, Matru Devo Bhava, Pitru Devo Bhava, then Acharya Devo Bhava, then an unfamiliar person, Atiti Devo Bhava. These are the four good teachers for you. Challenge one we had, Matru Devo Bhava. If the mother of the children has no confidence, has no exposure, she will bring up the kid with fear 
and dependence. Yeah. It's a fact. Jija Bai. Jija Bai brought up Shivaji, sir. True, true, sir. True. You name anyone, you name any person who inspired a generation, you will find his mother's role significantly larger in her life. Now, how many of our women have fantastic exposure and confidence to bring up great kids, a daughter or a son, whoever it is? And how much of our time is actually spent with our kids and imparting values that we have barely learned from our parents because our parents could not spend our time with us. So there is as such a 50% loss. Now from that 50% loss, another 10% only is getting transmitted to the next generation. So which is why, sir, I would not blame the kids. I would blame ourselves and our pursuit of happiness through monetary ways. Double income, no kids. This is the consequence of all these things. Isn't it, sir? At 30 and 40, you'll realize, oh my God, what have I done? But a seed that is not sown properly and fed properly will never become a big tree, sir. And that stunted tree will hunt you for life. What is the value of extra 50 crores and 100 crores? I think it's a deep moment for introspection for people of our age and commit ourselves to spend more time with our children and instill them good values. First by instilling it on ourselves. If I read Panchatantra, my son reads Panchatantra. If I read Arthashastra, my son reads Arthashastra. I can't preach what I don't practice. I think probably, sir, our solution to our civilizational upbringing also lies somewhere in this. At least this is what my, my small experience says. I'm sure you're all elders and uh, more experienced than me. But uh, this is what I thought I should add. Uh, I'll leave it to the professor, sir, now. Besides, um, in, uh, from the school level, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, we are not properly teaching the moral values, our systems, our role models. You know, this is what is happening in particularly in the last 30, 40 years, as a result of which, as Duaji mentioned, there are serious issues. I think from our part, we have to do it. And uh, from the education part, you know, government of India with the introduction of MEP, you know, it has uh, now come out with a system which is more nation-centric, value-based and all. So I hope that things will change in the coming years. Thank you. Uh, sir, thank you very much. It is a uh, very correct uh, explanation. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, only thing, a, a small worry is that uh, when we face the parents uh, of the youngsters, we give this type of uh, uh, like you know, suggestion. And when we ask them uh, right questions, they understand. They they understand that they, they miss the bus. But now, uh, looking forward, how the this type of uh, an education is going to reach the parents so that they will be able to stand by the youngsters and that, uh, whether government can have some intervention or how the society is going to itself correct. That is the worry that I, uh, I want to raise at this point, sir. Sir, just the way a family is an institution, government is also an institution. Government has no independent life of its own, sir. It is manned by us, people like us only. And there are lines that the government should not cross. There are lines that the family should not ask. Some things are better kept inside. And it's a journey, sir. Like they say, you no know, karma. That's what our ancestors believed in. We can't get everything right all the time. We do make mistakes. We pay for it. And then we redeem ourselves. It's not like the kids who are not prop, who did not get inputs in their life are totally gone. There are many late bloomers. There are many people who have become even better with their own experience. So it is not like they are retrie they are unretrievable forever. They are just bearing their karma, sir. One day they will also come back. It's just a matter of good exposure. True, sir. True, sir. It's a good, good people around them. The peer group changes, everything changes. The peer group has a totally, how do you put it, overwhelming impact on a person's mind. It's all about having one good guy in the French, in the French network. That one guy is like a candle. He will light up everyone. I understand. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic, sirs. Both of you, you have enlightened us and led the discussion into a very, very enriching session. 
and uh, the, the audience i thank the audience also for a very engaging uh, program today professor sir you would like to add something i know it's already time um, we have we have had a very good time with uh, our friend sai so he has given a lot of inputs to us for uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, as thoughts and he has given some ideas for policy making also if possible we can uh, uh, pass it on to the uh, g20 group of course this is a, for this purpose only we have created this y20 uh, even so i am extremely thankful to uh, all the participants and uh, our friend sai krishna uh, for making this evening an enlightening one thank you very much the pleasure is all mine thanks thanks for giving this opportunity and thanks to everyone for patiently bearing with me thanks to jagan and team uh, sure. for this program of course thank you thank you sir uh, coming uh, 19th we have a program uh, with professor ji and uh, dr sahana singh uh, on ancient indian approaches for sustainable living followed by that we have on uh, 24th with dr jagat shah the program will be future of work industry 4.0 and on 27th we will have a program with uh, jijit nadimuri ravi ji former scientist at isro on emergence of artificial intelligence and uh, changing landscapes at uh, works work, work forces so going forward we will be doing a series of programs stay tuned with us uh, due to paucity of time we are unable to take more questions look forward to seeing you in future programs and thank you so much vande matram dhanyawad thank you thank you thank you jai hind jai hind jai hind